Thank you, Adam. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I begin to, today by acknowledging the Gadigal and Gadigal people, uh, who are the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm joining this conference, and that this land was uh, never ceded. And I pay my deepest respects to their elders past and present. Um, so my name is Roberta Pava, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of New South Wales. Um, and I'm the postgraduate representative uh, for APPS. And um, just a remind, reminder that our hashtag is APPS21 and that the session is being recorded as Adam was saying. Um, and so if people do not want to appear on the recording, they should turn their cameras off and use the, the chat um, to ask their questions and, and make comments. Um, so I'm very excited <laughs> to be chairing a first plenary talk, uh, especially to introduce someone that I um, deeply admired. Um, Dr. Tao Fen is a research fellow in the Center of Excellence on Automated Decision Making and Society in the Emerging Technologies Research Lab at Monash uh, University. She's a feminist technoscience researcher who specializes in the study of gender and race in algorithmic culture. Uh, she has researched and published on topics including the aesthetics of uh, digital voice assistants like Siri, Amazon Echo, and Google Home, ideologies of post-race in algorithmic culture, and AI in popular culture. She is also the founder and convener of the Australasian STS Graduate Network. Um, or the CS. So the title of her talk is An Anthropogenic Table of Elements, Experiments in Collaboration with the Fundamental. Um, so I leave it up to you, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roberta. Um, just share my screen now. And you can see, um, you can, hopefully you can see my slides and not all my cheeky notes. We're good. Okay. So again, thank you, Roberta, for the kind introduction. My name's Tara Fan. I'm calling to you from the unceded lands of the Wandery people of the Kulin Nations in Nam, also known as Melbourne. I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to elders past, present and future, and to extend that respect to any Indigenous people who are tuning in today. I also want to take a moment to send out a special thank you to the entire ARPS organising team for the outstanding work you've done in putting together this conference under extremely difficult and unpredictable circumstances. You know, it's, it's so important to have societies like ARPS who do the hard work of keeping our intellectual communities together and alive, particularly in a time like this when we've been kept so far apart. So on behalf of all the conference attendees, I'd like to extend to you all a really a sincere thank you. So the project that I'm presenting today is the product of a long collaboration between myself and colleagues Timothy Neal at Deakin University and Courtney Addison at Victoria University, Wellington. It's a project that first took inspiration from what was at the time the upcoming 150 year anniversary of the iconic periodic table of chemical elements. The table is such an iconic expression of scientific thought, and we were really uh, taken with the ambition of its core principle, that is, to know and map life's elementary matter. As science and technology studies researchers, we're naturally very suspicious of such universalist and idealist claims. As Michelle Murphy has argued, the conceptualization of chemicals as abstract and discrete entities obscures the complexity and equity of our respective entanglements with toxicity and its infrastructures. But more than this, this discrete arrangement makes it impossible to address the political and moral questions of the Anthropocene. The harms and injustices of chemical elements like strontium, phosphorus or mercury are not in their status as single elements alone, but in their complex relationalities with environments, bodies and systems like settler colonialism, militarism, capitalism and more. But rather than rejecting or simply labelling the table as problematic, we wanted to stay with it. In Donna Haraway's famous words, to stay with the trouble of chemical elementality. So we decided to stage a series of experiments that return and revisit to the periodic table and its promise to make the elemental knowable. 
And as you'll soon hear, these are taking the form of an event, a curated collection of online essays, a parlor game, a visualization tool, and most recently, an edited book collection. And each iteration has been premised on the same set of provocations. What is elemental to this anthropogenic moment? What elemental forms are yet to emerge? And what political possibilities of justice and environmental reparation might they usher in? Along the way, we've enrolled more and more people to help us answer these questions. We've asked scholars, artists, activists and others to take an ironic stance towards the functionalism and naturalism of the chemical sciences, inviting them to nominate their own beings, materials, forces and other entities for a new anthropogenic table of elements. So this presentation has two parts. Um, I begin with a more detailed introduction to the Anthropogenic Table of Elements project before introducing some of the stories and elements we've collected over its various iterations. Um, and I'll then present a short ac extract from my own entry into our edited book collection, a speculative element that I've called the elements to come. So let's begin. <laughs> In their 2019 statement commemorating the 150th anniversary of the periodic table of chemical elements, the editors of the journal Nature remarked on its worldwide appeal, lauding its ability to communicate across varied audiences and its prominent status, not just within science, but also in the broader cultural imagination. Significantly, they also emphasised the table's utility in changing our perceptions of the universe from something vast and unknowable to something finite and tractable. There is clearly something about the periodic table that resonates with the wider audience, they wrote. Chemists should seek to tap into the fascination into the year ahead and highlight the importance of the original and still the best, the one that corrals all of the known atomic building blocks of the universe into an orderly array. While Mendeleev was neither the first nor the last to chart the chemical elements, it was the instrumentalist promise to give meaning, structure and order to an otherwise chaotic world that would give this table its longevity. In its earliest iterations, the items mapped in the table were said to represent a distinct material substance, something that was yet to be broken down into any more fundamental components by chemical means. This conceptualization of the essential material order of things encourages us to see the world as a derivative or composite of chemicals and the molecular realities, rather than as a mess of complicated stories and structures that cannot be reduced to their constituent parts. We first started thinking about the table and its elemental promise at the Anthropocene campus in Melbourne in 2018. Over the course of a week, we played with the classical elements of earth, fire, water and air. These familiar entities were made strange through workshops and field trips, encountering designed future fire ecologies, air engineered for human consumption, waters as sites of more than human obligation, and earthen mounds of non-biodegradable metal heavy human excrement that will likely outlast human life. Inspired by these uncanny elements and provoked by Mendeleev's chart, we then developed a series of essays inviting event participants to write short ethnographic vignettes of their own nominated substances. We received short stories on how mercury is used as an efficient but incredibly toxic technique for Kenyan miners to process gold deposits. How the promise of silicon based life forms is driving new forms of synthetic biology. How the demand for phosphorus in contemporary agriculture has created new environmental dead zones in places like Tunisia, and how chemical compounds like sodium monofluoracetate, or 1080 as it's more commonly known, is being used as a potent rodenticide in conservation efforts in Aotearoa, New Zealand, a paradoxical arrangement by which death sustains life. We then experimented with the new format at the Making and Doing exhibit at the 2019 making, meeting of the Society for Social Studies of Science, or 4S, in New Orleans. Leaning into the wordplay of a table of elements, we invited conference attendees to sit with us at a physical dinner table. At the centre sat plates arranged with cards representing different elemental entities. 
Each guest was then given a menu asking them to speculate on the precursors, coexistences and afterlives of the element they had chosen to consume. And as at the best of meals, our guests sometimes became unruly, talking over one another, raising questions about unseen connections, obscure histories and cryptic resonances. Like the iterative drafts of the periodic table by Mendeleev and others, our experiments with the elemental have built on each other while also making it increasingly clear that any selection or account of the elemental is necessarily partial. It is the sense of partiality that we hope to accentuate through each iterative test of possible ways to tabulate and narrate the elemental. While phrases such as the elemental and the Anthropocene gesture to vast scales anchored in deep time and impossibly complex and interconnected planetary narratives, the narrative collected across these experiments suggests that even the smallest, most humble stories are capable of powerful effects and vast interscalar journeys. To start a story close to the subject or close at hand or close to home, wherever it may be, invites engagement on more perceptible scales, on scales that matter. Partial stories by their nature resist any expectation that they could be mistaken for the whole and therefore remind us that no table or collection of the elemental could ever possibly be complete for all of us. In one experiment at the House de Culturen develops the shape of practice event in 2020, Education scholar Denise Fraser used the framework we had developed to map the elements of the carceral state in New Orleans and the wider US. The Anthropocene, disaster capitalism, racism and pandemics make up one temporal series. While the 32 elements at the centre of the table name some of the young black lives taken by police violence in the US during the last few years. Other rows specify elements relating to social movements, histories of redlining and removal, fence line communities, exposed to industrial toxins, and the Atlantic slave trade, amongst others. A claim to the elemental is therefore both methodological and political. Methodologically, it indicates the need for an analytic starting point and seeks to find one. But it's also a political claim to what is fundamental and therefore worthy of our attention. In our most recent experiment developing the collection into a book, we once again ask contributors to write chapter length responses to the provocation of what can be considered elemental. The chapters that emerged took one of two approaches. Some traced how a traditional chemical element like carbon or lithium or strontium have moved and morphed across time and place, revealing their complicity in anything but natural circuits of power. While others applied the label of the elemental to different entities entirely, sperm, seeds and cement, making the case that objects that may seem ancillary are actually the germ of other politics and material realities. So what does it do to these various objects and substances if we term them elemental to a situational predicament? Or put differently, what does elemental thinking do for us? Exactly which things are presented or chosen as foundational and why is precisely the kind of difficult question that our elemental thinking seeks to ask. Each claim to the elemental reflects a set of situated choices that exposes the irreducible role of subjectivity in naming and describing our relations to and with the world. It reminds us that we are not outside of the elementary matter, but a part of, but a part of it, constituting it as it constitutes us. The ter to term something elemental is thereby necessarily both a political and deeply intimate claim to importance at the level of being. It's an acknowledgement that our own bodies and subjectivities are a part of the scientific apparatus of knowing. In Mendeleev's periodic table, the arrangements of, el of elements can be read in a number of ways. Reading left to right and top to bottom, they are, they are arranged by their atomic weight. 
But then there are also columns, the alkaline metals and the noble gases, for example, and rows, the lanthanides and actinides. Rather than a linear table of contents and in the spirit of Mendeleev's original formulation, we chose to present our book chapters in a tabularized chart. So when what follows, one could read according to entity type, tracking between chemical elements, carbon, copper, lithium, strontium, organic life forms, cheese, mould, seeds and virus, material strata, cement, kerosphere, tectonics, ice, synthetic compounds, 1080 or mylar, bodily substances, sperm and testosterone, and as yet undiscovered or speculative matter, the elements to come. Another pathway is to read for geography, beginning your itinerary in Australasia and then over to Turtle Island and then elsewhere. Further readers might wish to negotiate the text through their theoretical formations, um, perhaps starting with those closest to Mendeleev um, with cheese and then over to the Gabriel Hecht clusters and Michelle Murphy clusters or tacking between sub-branches of the Karen Barad and Donna Haraway lines. Finally, readers might encounter the chapters in a random or alphabetical order and nonetheless be struck by the frequency by which certain narratives of capitalism, settler colonialism, militarism, racism, modernization and extractivism return as definitional to the Anthropocene across scales. Thinking elementally at each, as each experiment has tried to do, brings renewed focus to the infrastructural and, and ontological possibilities of this state of impairment. Renewed attention to how futures have been foreclosed and what might yet be composed out of what remains. In charting these relations and the traffic of material entities, be they molecular, geologic, or something else entirely, across domestic, industrial, and non-human settings, these experiments enjoin us to create common ground out of uncommon elements. Like Mendeley's periodic table, we hope that this series serves as both a guide to reactivity and a resource for its understanding, mapping those elements most susceptible to transformation, plotting sites where new entities might emerge or announce themselves. And with the time remaining, um, I'll now turn to a short reading from my own uh, entry into the Anthropogenic Table of Elements collection. This element is called The Elements to Come. So this essay begins with an empty space. The element that fills this space is classified as unknown in the time we call the present, but whose conditions of knowability direct us to think our relation to a time we call the future. This is the space for the elements to come. The elements that we do not yet know, but are compelled to keep space for nonetheless. This is a space defined by its orientation to what is intelligible in the current moment. The elements to come ask more than what might come next or what else could be an element. Instead, it asks us to consider the distance or the space between what is and what could be called elemental. For the chemist Dmitri Mendeleev, it was this empty space that defined his periodic system. His methodical layout of columns and rows was designed to not only identify and catalogue chemical elements and their properties, but to demonstrate recurring trends and patterns. It is through this periodic system, or periodicity, that the table could be used to derive relationship, relationships between not only known, but as yet undiscovered elements. In his earliest iterations of the table, Mendeleev left gaps within it and speculated on the properties that would logically fill these gaps. Interpolating from the mapped trends, Mendeleev was able to predict the properties of the unknown in impressive detail. In one famous example, he focused on the gap under the element al aluminium. He published a detailed description of the speculative element, predicting that it would have an atomic weight of approximately 68, a low melting point, an oxide character of 5.5 grams per centimetres cubed, and that it would dissolve slowly in both acids and alkalides, among other properties. Fifteen years later, in 1875, French chemist Emile Lecoq de Bourgian, empirically and independent of Mendeleev, identified the element known as gallium. The properties of gallium were almost identical to the one that Mendeleev had identified, down to the method of discovery itself, 
by means of a spectroscope. From its inception then, the periodic table has been used as a means to wrangle the unknown. For Mendeley, the table was an efficient template to bring order and connection, an opportunity to make a practical contribution to what he saw as the universal laws of nature. In this way, the table is an apparatus that actively shapes the terrain it claims only to describe, extending what critical decolonial scholars Heather Davis and Zoe Todd call an idealised version of the world modelled on sameness and replication. It was this ability to reduce radically different material phenomena to a flat ontology that Mendeleev saw as the central project of chemistry itself. Chemistry, he wrote, was a natural science which describes homogeneous bodies, studies the molecular phenomena by which these bodies undergo transformation into new homogeneous bodies, and as an exact science, it strives to attribute weight and measure to all bodies and phenomena, and to recognise the exact numerical laws which govern the variety of its studied forms. The gaps in the periodic table were, therefore, not empty, but bound to be filled, waiting for the right homogeneous body whose measurements fit the exact predetermined criteria. This predictive logic, based on inference and interpolation, today manifests in the algorithmic infrastructures that are problematically tasked with managing social life. Predictive analytics and risk models are used to make determinations on credit and loan eligibility, hireability and job fitness, exposure to education and housing opportunities, likelihood of crime recidivism, and even whether one is flagged for child safety or welfare monitoring. The platformization of media, news, music, games, films, television and social networks enfolds micro aspects of daily life into regimes of commercial manipulation driven by the promise of predictive analytics. On a macro scale, complex simulation models designed to predict, prevent and suppress large scale risks have birthed new regimes of anticipatory governance. In Australia, amidst unprecedented national bushfires and the spread of a deadly pandemic, the language of prediction, future-oriented statistics and images of flattened or rising curves, are the primary means by which a government communicates with a nation caught in cascading and, and seemingly endless waves of crisis. Indeed, the year 2020 and now 2021 has for many been an object lesson in how elemental predictive logics have become in shaping the apex and infrastructures of contemporary life worlds. While ostensibly oriented towards the future, in practice many predictive models operationalize the past. In the same way that, as Michelle Murphy writes, the fullness of our chemical relations is made imperceptible by the pervasive rendering of chemicals as disconnected functionalist molecules, human behaviour is ontologically flattened in order to create interoperable data sets. It's not just the case that this data is taken out of context, but rather that this data is put to use in an ever-expanding field of context. Indeed, within the Nudge economy, all information is useful information if it can potentially trigger desirable or even profitable behavioural interventions. At their worst, these systems not only perpetuate inequality, but foreclose alternate possibilities for futures that do not conform to previous patterns or expectations. In this way, predictive systems serve as, serve as formalised instruments of racialization and injustice elemental to the forms of racism, sexism, ableism, encoded into the default settings of technology and society. As many critical race and technology studies scholars have argued, what makes these systems uniquely dangerous is that they travel under the sign of empirically justified objective calculations, making it difficult to enforce accountability or political responsibility. Prediction here proceeds on the regressive logic of sameness and replication, futures that are intelligible so long as they resemble the past. As with the periodic table, these predictions function more like self-fulfilling prophecies that, in Wendy H.K. Chun's words, closes the world it pretends to open. One of the central goals of our collection has been to disrupt this regressive and cyclical logic 
So while also oriented toward a time and place called the future, the, the elements to come is grounded in a wholly different ethical onto epistemology to prediction. The elements to come is a reconfiguration of justice to come, a phrase most famously associated with the philosophy of Jacques Derrida. In his writing on justice and law, Derrida describes justice as an aporetic experience or an experience of the impossible. He argues that normative understandings of a just act assume that a correct procedure has been followed, be it judicial, moral or something else. This procedure is calculable and defined by a rule, a norm or a universal principle. However, what this process describes, he argues, is not justice, but law. Droid. Justice, by contrast, exceeds any determinate rule or law. It demands more than any rule can encompass. He writes, law is the element of calculation and it is just that there be law, but justice is incalculable. It requires, it requires us to calculate with the incalculable. And aporetic experiences are the experiences, as improbable as they are, necessary of justice. That is to say, of moments in which the decision between just and unjust is never ensured by a rule. Justice, therefore, is something that never arrives, but is always to come. Justice, in Derrida's words, is the experience we are not able to experience. My use of justice to come, however, is not drawn directly from Derrida, but comes instead by way of feminist theorist Karen Barad. Unlike the former, Barad's phrase hyphenates each element, linking them as one. In this way, justice to come visually illustrates the incalculability of justice. Its irreducibility to something that is knowable and the now, and instead marks itself as contingent on an indeterminate time we call to come. For Barad, justice to come as a single word serves as an invitation to see justice not as a state that can be achieved once and for all, but as an infinite pursuit, an ongoing ethical practice. More than this, justice to come invites us to attune to other forms of indeterminacy without surrendering to what without surrendering to what Donna Haraway describes as abstract futurisms and its effects of sublime despair and politics, politics of sublime indifference. It's precisely this ethical attunement that the elements to come seeks to draw on and impress. Like justice to come, elements to come is defined by its relation to indeterminacy. Here, the hyphens mark the elements as entities that are never discrete. As the chapters in this collection have demonstrated in vivid detail, elements, chemical or otherwise, cannot be separated from the relationalities they engender, nor the stories that they unfold. Elements are only intelligible through their chemical milieus, in their frictions and circulations, in bodies and law, and as experienced through their aftermath and injuries. The stories articulated here are quite literally innumerable, too many to be counted. From carbon to copper, mylar to mould, whatever we have deemed elemental has earned that title through its complex array of entanglements with bodies, human and non-human, living and non-healing, with places, near and far, visible and invisible, with time, still unfolding, already past, yet to come, and frameworks that help us to situate all these things across vast narratives and scales. The Anthropocene, settler colonialism, militarism, capitalism, extractivism, and more. Yet for every elemental story collected here, there is an indeterminate number that remain untold, and that we, and that we must accept might never be told. Like justice, however, this does not hinder our pursuit, but instead figures it as an ongoing ethical practice. In this way, the hyphens that connect the elements to come work to eschew the representation of chemicals as structurally isolated, finite beings. They operate as reminders to ensure that even in the practice of writing the word element, it never sits alone on the page, always followed by something that is to come. So while this essay may conclude the book, it does not point to the end. 
Like Mendeleev's periodic table, to end with an empty space is really to suggest the beginning. The elements to come is defined through its indeterminacy. This indeterminacy disrupts the logic of prediction, a logic that by definition seeks to render the future calculable. But the elements to come offers a way out of this endless cycle of regressive futures because what, because what is to come is always incalculable. What is offered here is nothing less than the infinity, infinity of future possibility. Excuse me. <laughs> The desiring orientation towards something else, something to come. But rather than rushing to fill the empty space like Mendeleev, we should instead accept an invitation posed by Parad. She says, let us pause before this silence, before rushing on. While it's tempting to seek to fill this space with other elements and elemental stories, or to reconfigure the table as something other than a book or a pile of game, we should, even just for a moment, pause in recognition of indeterminacy. This might be the indeterminacy of entangled relationalities, the full breadth of which we might never know, the indeterminacy of others who we can never fully account for, or it might be the indeterminacy of nothingness itself an empty space. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Tao. This was amazing. Really, what a treat. Please excuse my cat, she's <laughs> insistent oh, no, this it. morning. <laughs> <laughs> she's being invited in. Yeah, um, multi-species keynote, excuse me. <laughs> oh, this was incredible, thank you so much. Um, so, I would like now to open um, for questions and uh, comments from the audience. Let's see. And Martin will be helping me find them, getting questions and um, maybe a full gallery screen. Okay. I do have a question about um, the the role of the irony in your method. You were talking about playing with the elements and how you all got together um, and how, um, yeah, irony is sort of used as a way to think about elements and the fundamental differently. And I was, mm -hmm. yeah, I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about the, the role of irony in this project and maybe what you think I don't know, irony can do for academic methods or mm -hmm. yeah, something like that. I'm not sure if this makes sense. <laughs> no, no, it does. Um, no, thank you so much. I mean, um, I'm a very big Donna Haraway fan. Um, and, you know, a few years ago, sort of before my PhD, even sort of my earliest foray into the sort of first foot in the door into academic life was in writing a thesis on Donna Haraway's Manifesto for Cyborgs. Um, and the use of irony in that particular text is, I think, um, really telling of a particular turn in feminist technoscience, um, that is to move away from what she calls sort of the abstract negation of, of big science. Yeah. Right. So that as a as sort of as um, feminist science and technology studies scholars, it's sort of not enough just to reject science, just to see problems and, and move away from them. Um, you know, we need to risk an encounter with these with science. And you know, so much of science and technology studies in particular really is about risking that encounter. Um, uh, and so for her, for a manifest of a cyborgs, it was taking an ironic stance towards a figure like the cyborg that at that particular moment when she was writing in sort of mid 80s, um, that, you know, the cultural imaginary was just soaked in these images of bad cyborgs, you know, masculinist images of like the Terminator or whatever that were going to sort of, that were really sort of reifying these binaries between nature and culture and masculine and feminine, um, the technology and the flesh and so on. 
And so she was like, no, how could we, what, you know, what is an ironic stance we can take to the cyborg? Well, the cyborg is sort of a wonderful figure for thinking through. So the breaking of boundaries, the conjoining of these things, you know, because it literally is technology and flesh. Mm. Um, and the same way here, we sort of wanted to adopt that same thing. You know, it's not just about the abstract negation of chemistry <laughs> and saying that, you know, the table of elements is, is flawed and bad. So, you know, baby out with the bathwater. It was about sort of um, thinking through what else, what, you know, sitting with, sitting with the science that we saw as problematic, sitting with an account that was sort of not necessarily um, in lots of STS scholarship, like not good accounts of what is actually happening, um, mm. but sort of having the generosity to sort of do something else with it. Beautiful, thank you. Such a beautiful way to put that. Um, yeah, so anyone else would like to make a comment or ask a question to Tao? <clears throat> I, just, I just wanted to oh. say how... Sorry. Hello. No, no, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, praise um, the artistic elements of the project because as someone who teaches art history and theory um, and is very in interested in interdisciplinary work, I, I, I'm always going to promote the idea of art being a way into science. So I, as I was listening to the talk, I was just um, really... Uh, pleased with the quite artistic aspects of the project and that merging of art and science which of course the further back you go in, a, in our history of course they weren't they were together that you know they weren't these separate mm. entities so yeah it was really interesting yeah definitely I mean I know, thank you so much for that um, you know, the more we looked into the history of the elements you know so much of it goes back to a time when before we had that rupture between between disciplines, between practice, between art and science, you know, the earlier sort of um, Greek philosophers were natural philosophers, which is what we now call scientists, um, but they would never sort of make those kinds of distinctions. And it's something that we really wanted to sort of like enfold back into our practice. Um, and we've really like, I mean, one of the reasons I really wanted to present this particular project um, uh, it's because I think, you know, uh, history and philosophy of science people, social studies and science people are really quite good at doing this work um, whether it is science communication sort of making it like you know a, you know uh, communicating with the public about science explaining things to people in ways that are like more intelligible than sort of the academic practice would have us think um, or, or whether it's yeah revisiting sort of like these ruptures um, in disciplinary knowing um, and it's been really uh, great for me personally because I don't really have yeah I don't really have an artistic background or anything I don't really have a practice before this I had not considered myself as having a practice based academic practice you know um, and that it was sort of more abstract and more you know theory based and so on but you know I think um as an early career researcher, I really surprised myself that I was able to sort of play with it more and, and, and fold more people into that. And it's really been, it's really why it's had so much life, you know, that the more people you can bring into it, the sort of, you know, you will never fully know your project because it lives with so many other people as well. And it's really pleasing to me because it's exactly the kind of, you know, the, the, the philosophy behind the entire sort of elemental ways of knowing. Oh, beautiful. Anyone else would like to make a comment? Thank you, Vincent, for that. Feel free to unmute and just um, ask the question. Jatha's got a question there, I think. Oh. Uh, thank you. Th um, thanks for that. Thank you so much, Atal. That was fantastic. Um, really enjoyed the talk. Um, I wondered if you could say a little bit about your experiences of um, uh, working with uh, scientists, with chemists. I think you mentioned that was part of what you were trying to do um, to get them to think about um, how these uh, historical, social, economic uh, relations are all sort of, you know, co-produced or embedded in those elements. Um, uh, yeah, so I wondered, because, uh, yeah, you know, many of us, I think, are trying to 
um, develop those sorts of ways of engaging with um, with science, but also with scientists, um, if you like, in, in doing some of this work. Mm. So it would mm. be great to sort of yeah um, hear about your um, uh, kind of experience experiences, any lessons um, in that regard. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Sajatha. Um, uh, so for a lot of us, a, a lot of the moments, the moments of contact we've had with, with, with scientists um, is when we've gone and done field trips as part of events. Um, and really what that meant was it, stepping out of our comfort zone and into their, their spaces of practice. Um, and so, for example, this has meant things like uh, at the Anthropocene campus, they built into that event were a series of field trips where we went to places like the Botanic Gardens, um, like the Werribee Treatment Plant, which is um, sort of a waste cycling, water, water recycling plant out in Melbourne. Um, to places like environmental gardens and so on um, and asking them to sort of you know usually host us uh, take us on tours and sort of talk us through you know their practice and to help us understand and at the same time we would usually sort of host an activity at the same you know on site wherever we were and for most of the chemists and stuff, you know, they just wanted to most of the scientific people there they just just kind of naturally took took part in our activities. Um, it was sort of, I guess this was a sneaky sort of smuggling them into what we were already doing in some ways. Um, uh, Cause I think if we had set, said straight up, like we're going to be pretending to sit at a table and play this game where you pick an element and you pretend to eat it and you talk about its toxicity as it courses through your body. I don't think they would have been on board with that. <laughs> so um, I think there was the, the element of surprise. Um, and to be able to help them sort of surprise themselves in some ways. Um, but to do that, that first required some humility on our part, which was to um, uh, go where they were comfortable and sort of learn from their expertise first before we charged in with our own agenda. Thank you. Thanks for that, that was great. Oh, Gemma, go ahead. Thanks for that, Tal. That was really excellent. Um, I want to, you, you just mentioned the Werribee treatment plant, and I grew up in Werribee, so this is making me think of a question. Um, for me, like growing up near that um, plant, uh, it was not very nice. If you went outside of Werribee, it was not very nice. So people would kind of tease you or bully you for being near a sewage plant, living near a sewage plant. Um, that's my childhood. Um, but, but when, but when you were actually in Werribee, they would take you on tours. So I assume it was like actually pretty similar and it always seemed like such a, for me, it was really this, this place of transformation where I could take something that, or, or could understand that something that was understood as inherently negative and actually see it like it's got a wetland there and stuff. It's a beautiful place actually. And to see it, this possibility in science. And actually it was probably one of the things that encouraged me to go into environmental science. I was wondering if there was not necessarily that, but was there anything um, that you found particularly transformative or inspirational or really opening up that future of possibilities that you were talking about in this project for you personally? Mm -hmm. No, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for sharing for sharing that story. I mean, yeah, as you say, the Werribee treatment farm um, is a poo farm, so it smells a lot. <laughs> it smells a lot, and there's um, there's like really super fascinating uh, like kind of abandoned communities now, but like communities called Kokorok that uh, used to consist of people who communities that like. Who, the, whose sole purpose was to service the plant and they were like the poo people and there's lots of documented sort of stuff around their discrimination and how bullied they were and how they had a football team but they weren't allowed to play all that kind of stuff um uh and as you say yeah it's a really remarkable place of transformation not just emotional transformation as sort of you've put out but of like literal physical environmental transformation you know it's a place of waste and decay that um is so quickly um you know a place of like as you say verdant life because there is a really beautiful wetland out there but you know with the kakarot community um they used to raise heifers like big big cows herefords there and they would raise like these beautiful award-winning like strongest cows ever because they were lived on this poo farm so they had endless supplies of water during times of drought 
Um, but again, the discrimination was that they weren't allowed to enter their Herefords into any competitions because it was deemed unfair that they had endless supplies of water, whereas all the other farmers did not. Um, uh, so there's, there's that definitely. I mean, uh, like I said, I think probably personally the spaces of transformation were really in for me to rethink my academic practice because so far I had been doing my PhD especially was very solitary, was not, was not a thing of collaboration and this could not have been done not just without Tim and Courtney but without all the authors that we'd invited in to make their contributions. Um, you know, all the theoretical thinking we've been able to do has been done, genuinely has been done in, in collaboration with all of them. Um, and each iteration through which we run through this cycle of, you know, we'll, we'll sort of uh, go through and invite more and more people to submit and nominate their own materials, beings and forces. Every time we do that, somebody gives you something that surprises you. And that makes you kind of fundamentally go back and rethink. Um, which is why I love sort of uh, Karen Barad's phrase of returning, you know, like a rock that you pull over again and again and again. Um, that's what it feels like to me. And again, in each turn, it, it, it makes me rethink what, what is possible for me to do as a scholar. It's not just about um, putting out publications. I mean, really out of all this, the only like peer reviewed thing that has happened is the book in the most recent iteration, but everything else has still been so, so valuable. And everything else has actually been like um, uh, still sort of a form of recognition of academic practice that I think we should be leaning into more. And again, that's why I wanted to present it now, because I feel like not enough of that is <laughs> celebrated, um, that doing things like running a game with people as a form of academic output, as a form of academic practice is like uh, that should be acknowledged more. <laughs> that's fantastic. What a great, um, great suggestion, especially for all the postgraduates out there <laughs> um, listening to this and knowing that there are other ways of, you know, being together and collaborating and doing academic work. Um, that was great. Thank you so much, Dal. Um, okay, so anyone else has a question? I really like the, um, let me see if I'm checking everyone, okay. Um, I really like the aspect of um, taking, of thinking about the ethics of what remains compared to the idea of the elemental as this, um, you know, sort of autonomous and yeah, fundamental as this separate distinctive things and instead try to work with not only um, the elements as uh, interdependent and how, as they transform, but also as how they remain or what remains of them through all these um, histories of violence. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know if there's, there's not really a question here. I just particularly no, no. like that aspect there of sort of shifting the perspective from trying to look at something at, 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 you know, as you were saying, as nature or um, mm. or these chemicals uh, in these fixed ways. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, for, for us, there's this question of what remains, this Donna Haraway staying with the trouble. I mm. mean, what makes that provocation so powerful is that this is, it really does capture the ethical conundrum we have in the Anthropocene, that we are living on a dying planet, you know, and, um, and, it's not about abandoning that cause of the planet. You know, it, you know, the earth has sort of slipped. Realistically, we're now facing an idea that the earth has slipped into not only something that can't be rescued, but like it's slipping straight into entropy. So, so thinking ethically and politically with that prospect is a really challenging thing to do. And I think it is like the question of anthropogenic climate change. Mm. Um, and so, you know, that's why we wanted to, again, throw the baby out of the bathwater that's not sufficient. You know, using your billions of dollars to, like, go to another planet to seek more resources to extract is not, is not a sufficient answer. Yeah. Thank you, yes. I really love this project. It's, yeah, it's amazing. When uh, is the book already out? 
out or no it is not uh when are when it's gonna be out um it is going to be hopefully out next year with the university of toronto press i mean like everything it's just run on covid time yeah that's <laughs> that's so it goes you know um yeah we're really we're really happy with it i mean in just as a quick plug for our lunchtime for our lunchtime oh, session yes. in our, at lunchtime session at 12 30 which Roberta is like kindly hosting with me we'll be running another iteration of this once again where ideally if we were in person i would have suggested that we had sat down at a physical table um and played our game out but um i've got a digital table for us all to sit at um, and to work through not so much a table an anthropogenic table of elements but a table of elements um, for research practice so for all the students out there and but also everyone else who's listening some, i think it's an interesting provocation to think through you know what is elemental to our research practices yeah um, what what nourishes and sustains us if we were to lean into this metaphor of of dining and food and so on what nourishes and sustains us what kind of hospitality practices do we need to just to throw quickly to sort of Adam's like quite right like dire situation of the university sector right now um, again um, we could think about like burning down the universities and starting again, but kind of this is what we have, what remains now, um, and how can we live in what is sort of like a, a crumbling system? Great point. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the event later. Of so you trying to think about those connections between what sustains your body, you know, bodily, and your practice as a knowledge making you know, academic and scholar and how to think of those things together. Um, so uh, let's see if there are any other questions or comments. Uh, so, yes, so we have Samara and Jodi. Uh, let's start with Samara. Hi, yes, thank you. That was really wonderful, fascinating. I was just interested in if you've got some uh, future plans, what else are you going to look at experimenting with in this same space? I'd be fascinated to know. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it might just be the unknowable, might it? <laughs> um, uh, I mean, the one thing I have been thinking about is when the book finally does come out into um, doing, doing something more interesting um, than a standard uh book launch so for example um so as a part of my you know through doing projects like this i will say organizing events like the anthropocene campus and and conferences and so on like i've been very interested in sort of public institutions cultural institutions so um i've been in sort of lots of talks with science works and melbourne museum um, science gallery here in Melbourne around different kinds of things, different events we could host with them. And one of the things we're thinking about um, for our book launch is maybe, you know, um, apparently during the 150th anniversary of the periodic table at one of the science galleries, I think in London, they invited people to bring in examples of the elements that they had just around the homes like mercury, lithium, whatever, and they were built them up into a physical pyramid. Um, so you could sort of see the mundaneness of elements. And again, being able to physically picture, you know, and, and how these things could never actually be classified as just one element or another. They're always, they're always entangled, always within the milieu, always find meaning in that way. Um, and so, yeah, it was like a physical pyramid of a table of elements um, that, that, that totally undid itself in so many ways, which I think is just fascinating. And I would love to do something like that next. You know, I'd love to just sort of push it into this like, um, like exhibition space or something like that. Um, you know, that would be a really fun thing to do. I'd love to go that way because yeah, I guess once it becomes a book, you've kind of, there are so many, there are only so many ways you can keep writing about it, but there are not, there's more ways to think about it if you if you all of a sudden expand it into creative practice then there's just like innumerable ways to start playing with it and really once uh, you know eventually it will stop being ours and when the book comes out really the hope is that other people will start taking it up and that's when again it's sort of when it ends with me it's not really the end it's sort of the beginning for somebody else and that would be the real um the real thing that would make me very happy 
Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, I look forward to that, <laughs> to any of the things that might come out of this. Um, and thanks for that question, Samara. And then uh, Jodi has raised her hand. Go ahead. Hi, thanks, Tao. That was so interesting. I loved it. Um, and I also have a dog roaming around and jumping on my lap, so I love seeing your cat um, jumping the screen as well. Um, mine might be a bit of a vague question, but I was really interested in the idea of um, elements to come as self-fulfilling prophecies. And I wondered if you could say a bit more about that and maybe also kind of if there's tension between like that blank space and like creativity versus self-fulfilling prophecy or... I don't know if that's a bit too vague, um, but yeah, I was really interested in that idea of self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, um, uh, the self-fulfilling prophecy stuff. I mean, that really comes out of my my background in media studies and algorithmic culture, and a lot of my engagement with the work of people like Wendy Chun, who I really really admire. And she's got this new book, which has just arrived actually, um, called "Discriminating Data." Um, which is which really is all about what I've presented today. I mean, I, I really can't claim any originality around sort of the work that what I was talking about with prediction, um, because so much of it is influenced by people like Chun. Um, but this really is like an entire book based on how the principles at the heart of network science um, have, you know, what is the history of those principles? And she traces them through things like phrenology or eugenics or segregation and so forth. So to use one example, um, she has written quite a lot on the concept of homophily, which is a principle in network science that structures a lot of how news feeds run and how social media runs. And this is a principle that is like birds of a feather flock together. Things that are alike belong together. Things that are like sameness breed sameness type of thing, right? So if you like something and, you know, if you're similar to that person, then you'll like similar things. And that's how we've gotten to this, like, kind of interesting moment of, like, filter bubbles um, uh, and sort of people who are, like, kind of quite extreme and polarised points of view on social media in particular. Um, and she does a really great thing to, like, trace trace muffly back into where do we get that principle from and that principle comes from uh, social science from uh, housing projects in Philadelphia where media communication scholars like Paul Lazarsfeld did studies to see uh, whether um, mixed race housing projects people preferred to stay together or stay apart in a time of like deep segregation and that principle they found was like, oh, well, like people belong together. You know, people still naturally segregated themselves in different ways, essentially. And so that just one, one study from one like very specific social context now structures the entire of social life around the world. Um, um, and that, that's that kind of self-fulfilling prophecy element, that sort of like histories that have sort of become ingrained into our infrastructures and sort of trap us within them. And, and, and algorithms and algorithmic culture is so commonly sort of critiqued along those lines, and I think rightly so. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that, that is trying, breaking out of that was what I was trying to get at, yeah, with elements to come. And I'm wondering how, yeah, how does creativity fit into that? Um, I, I suppose it's just even the, like, creative tenacity to, to, to reject a principle like homophily to begin with um, and to stage your own experiments to show that actually that is, that, it is not, that it is not necessarily how things go, that there are more exceptions to the rule than, than the rule themselves. Um, um, but yeah, I wish, I wish I had a more sort of interesting response. I don't know. Did you have a creative practice at all? Is this something that you've been thinking about? No, I wish I did. I'm not creative in the slightest. Um, but yeah, I just, I was really interested in, yeah, in, in just the tension between those two things. And I think it seems like it's a really nice part of your project. Um, but yeah, no, that's, I love that um, history about the algorithmic data and um, yeah, it was really fascinating. Thank you. But yeah, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have anything useful to say there. Sorry. Uh, no, that's all right. I mean, I think, um, uh, I mean, the one thing I say, like what is deemed creative and what is not, I think comes down to the sameness and replication thing often, right? It's like if you keep doing the same thing, then, you know, it's not, it's, you know, certain practices are not inherently creative. 
certain ways of thinking are not inherently creative. It's like sort of in the breaking of the ice, that's when something's creative in the first, first time that it's done. But the more times that it's done, the less creative it is, right? Then it becomes formulaic. Like, um, like, you know, this is why people don't like blockbuster movies because they're too formulaic. But sometimes that's why people love it because they know exactly what they're going to get. And whether, whether those movies are like creative or not, I don't think you can just say one or the other. It's like up to whatever, that, whatever expectation the viewer has going into it then perhaps it's like being creative within the formula that's why people sort of love like the new wolverines or whatever <laughs> because they're like yeah because they're like within genre but playing with genre oh that's funny thank you um and that's yeah, my I, take on marvel <laughs> yeah, no, I, love it. <laughs> I love it and yeah i think it's really interesting this uh, idea of you know being creative and bringing the creativity into the the way we we create knowledge and and at the same time we create worlds and how often most people you know don't think they, yeah, they I mean, creative I think, and totally I mean I think that's why so many academics don't think about themselves as creative even yeah, though what exactly. we do we write like writing is one of the most creative things this is not something that we uh, do enough for now um graduate research training is to teach to to address students as creative people yeah. who are making something. And I think that's why I think people often, particularly in our profession, can feel so sort of like stale in what we do because yeah. it's just formulaic now. It's just pumping. It's just doing the same thing again and again. That's why teaching for the first time is so wonderful and life-giving. But when you've taught for the hundredth time, it's like it's not as quite as exciting. <laughs> but like, mm -hmm. um, or same with, um, you know, publications. It's like... Um, sometimes I think early career researchers do some of the most exciting and creative work, whereas some people who have been in the profession for a long time, I think they've lost their relationship with creativity because it's just about fulfilling the criteria for being employed. Mm. Yeah, it's which really is not good. on them, by the way, which is not on them at all. It's, it's, it's on a system that makes people feel insecure no matter where they are in the ladder. Like that there are full professors that are like frightened of getting fired is like a terrible thing because that shapes all the practice that they do and everybody else that follows. Yeah, absolutely. So how we decide what is creative and what is not creative, it goes back to that idea of, you know, patterns and, and mm. um, yeah, creating sameness, even in a practice that is supposed to do sort of the opposite or mm. to undo those sort of patterns. Mm. Um, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, another five um, minutes left. Um, does anyone would like? Does anyone uh, want to say anything? Any comment? Um, we could potentially do um, five minutes quickly. I don't know if Martin agrees. That sort of like breakout rooms and quick icebreaker so that we can get to know each other as if uh, we were in a mm. live. Well, I mean, even I might just like take up my own provocation of pausing before the silence, <laughs> which is to say that um, um, I don't even, I don't mind if we want to finish early because it's a long day on Zoom for so many people, if people need to just not have their cameras on for five minutes before they start their next <laughs> session, that's totally fine with me. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, there's a there's a little break now from 10.15 to 10.30. So at 10.30, we have the, the next uh, three set or the first three sessions of the conference. Um, and so there's time now bet between now and 10.30 to take a break and stretch a little bit, have a glass of water or something, or get some air and then get back into it. Um, but yeah, it will be a long day. So I'm... Um, I'm, I'm happy as well if we want, if we feel like we can finish it here. Um, what does everyone else think? I see some nods. I'd say yes. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so I'd like to thank you so much again, Tao. This was so brilliant. A beautiful way to start our conference. Uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, amazed. Beautiful work. Thank you so much. And thank you for the thank audience you. for being here, for your questions. Um, it means a lot. And yeah, so good luck with your presentations and the next sessions throughout the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. Thank you, Tao. Thank thanks, Tao. That was great. Thanks very much. That was great. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Thanks very much.